Well, welcome everybody back to class for week five. Can you believe it? You're over halfway there. You're well into writing your exegetical paper. And so, so far in our journey together, we've looked at uh, observation, which where we dig for the goal. The goal's not on the surface. It's down beneath the surface where we learn to ask the five W's and the one H question and then look at all the our grammar and our parts of speech and, and comparison, contrast, metaphors. We begin to load what to look for. And so the key phrase in observation is, the devil is in the details. And then we looked at contextual analysis, and there's lots of different contexts. There's the context we bring, there's the historical context, there's the social context, cultural context, political context, all sorts of contexts that we have to pay attention to in the text. And so whenever we do contextual analysis, the question we always ask is, who says so? So we need to make sure that, um, that we're drawing the right conclusions from our contextual analysis. And then we went from contextual analysis to formal analysis, okay? And formal analysis is where we look at genre or literature. And so when we look at genre or literature, we're asking the question, how do it do what it do? How do it do what it do? We're looking at the form and how the author chooses to communicate through certain forms is very, very important. Remember, we looked at like a newspaper and how we have our, our instincts on how to um, intuitively interpret the front page versus the sports page versus the editorial. That's what we do when we do formal analysis. And in your formal analysis, you also included the structure and movement and the outline of your individual passage. And so um, before we dive into detailed analysis, detailed analysis is what we're going to look at this week, uh, I want to just remind us that there are three important takeaways, and I never want us to lose sight of the three takeaways from this class. Number one is we always move from the whole to the parts. This is called the hermeneutical spiral, whole to parts and parts to whole, but we always start with the box top the big picture first. And so we learned last week that the big picture of the book of Ephesians is it's the gospel of the church. Secondly, we always look at context and our exegetical cheer is context, context, context. And then last but not least, we're really picking this up from Dr. McKnight's book where we understand that the Bible is a story not just a set of thoughts or ideas or propositions or statements about God. It's a story, and we have to learn how to read it as story. So you ready? Are you ready to dive in to detailed analysis? And so the phrase I want you to remember here is follow the clues to solve the mystery. Follow the clues to, so, to solve the mystery. And so let's dive into some detailed analysis here. And so uh, this comes a quote from John Chrysostom, one of the early church fathers in the 300s. And he wrote these very powerful words. I love them. It says, we hope through such painstaking interpretation to train you in the importance of not passing over even one slight word or syllable in the sacred scriptures. Not one syllable, for they are ordina not ordinary utterances, but the very expression of the Holy Spirit. And for this reason, it's possible to find great treasure even in a single syllable. So when we do detailed analysis, we are taking an in-depth look at the trees in the forest. We're studying the individual trees in the forest, and that's gonna mean something in just a moment for you. And so when we do exegesis, in our very first week in our class, we gave a definition of exegesis, and exegesis is simply the close reading of the text. It's reading very closely. It's careful reading of the text, and so, Detailed analysis is the essential feature. It's the key component of how we do close reading of the text. So we're going to pay attention to words, phrases, allusions. We're going to have to do grammar as much as we hate English. We're going to have to learn to do grammar. We're going to look at syntax, which is how words relate to one another, their word order, that kind of thing. So exegesis involves 
careful and close reading of the text. So this comes from uh, a very familiar verse found in the Sermon on the Mount with Jesus, where Jesus tells the disciples, For verily, verily, I tell you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. That little term jot and tittle comes from the Hebrew. And so Jesus is saying jot is the yod. It's the smallest, the 10th letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's like a little apostrophe. And so he says not even that little apostrophe or tittle refers to the extension of a line when writing Hebrew words that makes a difference between how you understand the Hebrew word resh, the Hebrew letter resh, and the Hebrew word dalet. Just one little extension of the letter makes all the difference. And so Jesus is saying, we have to pay attention to every single detail and every detail really matters. So that's what we're doing in in detailed analysis is paying attention very closely to the jots and the tittles. But here's an important warning and the warning is this, don't ever lose sight of the forest, okay? We're looking at the trees but don't stay so focused on the trees that you miss the forest. Another way of saying it is don't micro-focus on the piece so much that you miss the big picture of the puzzle. And so we always want to keep that balance in mind. And so that's a helpful warning in this process as you dive into the details. Don't get so lost in the details that you miss the big picture and how those details fit within the big picture. So this is the process that we're unfolding right now before you. Uh, you're a detective. You're, think of your favorite detective show. They're on TV and everybody has their favorite detective show. I'm an old guy and I remember Columbo. And Columbo would solve the mystery by following the clues. And so that's your job, is to follow the clues in the text to solve the mystery like a detective would. So a rookie detective goes to a crime scene and misses important details. But a wise veteran detective who solved many mysteries before knows exactly how to sort through all the evidence and come up with the solution to the mystery of what happened and how it happened. And so that's our job in the detailed analysis process to look at all the evidence, decide which facts are most important and then to draw important conclusions from the facts that you gather, okay? And so you'll get better. You'll learn to see more the more you do more of this. So let's keep going here. You're a detective, and there are tools that you're going to use to solve the mystery are words, phrases, and sentences. We're going to look at words, phrases, and sentences. And so it's important for you to know this is probably a quiz question, The sentence is the most basic unit of meaning. The sentence is the most basic unit of meaning. And words and phrases are used to comprise or make up a sentence. And so a sentence is made up of words and phrases. And these words and phrases only have meaning within the context of a sentence, the most basic unit of meaning. So let's dive in a little bit closer and look at this concept of word. Any of you ever play Scrabble? So Scrabble is taking words, letters, and putting them together, making words. And so words, we're going to look at and how we understand the meaning of words. And in your detailed analysis, in your final uh, paper, you're going to need to do at least two word studies. We'll talk about that more in person in class. But we need to talk a little bit about words right now. So words are um, we call lexical analysis. And that's just a fancy way of saying a dictionary definition of a term, okay? You're familiar with your Webster's Dictionary, and in English, we open our dictionary, and we find the definition of a word, and it's usually got one, two, three, four, five, six different meanings, and then it gives you uh, uses of those words. And so we're looking at the definition of terms and how we come up with the definition of key terms in the scriptures. And so um, just a quick little uh, practice for you to go through is I want you to figure out which words are most important in John chapter 1, verse 14. 
So when you look at this text, and the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. Which of those words do you want to investigate in more in depth? So look at it closely with me again. And think about it. If you were going to study this passage, which words are critical to the meaning of the text? And which words are you going to choose to go more in depth on? Now, we have a limited amount of times, and so these are critical decisions. We don't have hundreds of hours to invest in all of, in Bible study, so we have to make the use, best use of the hours that we do have, and so we have to make important decisions around which words really matter. So look at it again. Which ones would you choose with your limited time to investigate further? And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Now, if I ask each individual exegete expositor in the room, you would all come up with a few of the same words and probably a lot of different words that stand out to you. And so, lived among us, dwelled among us, is an important word. Flesh became flesh, the incarnation is an important term. The concept of word, the logos became the living word. And so word is an important. You could see glory as a repeated term. You may want to investigate that. Grace and truth are important concepts. So you could pick a number of words here, but I'm just showing you that, um, that lexical work is important and your decisions are important about which words matter most. All right, you need to understand a couple of um, these hard hermeneutical terms that you don't use commonly in your vocabulary, but you'll see this in hermeneutics and in commentaries. And so we know, need to know the difference between denotation and connotation. That'll probably be on a quiz, okay? Denotation versus connotation. Denotation refers to the literal, precise meaning of a term. Okay, it's the literal, the most literal meaning. So childlike, the term childlike means literally and precisely like a child. But then there are connotations. Connotations are implied or suggested meanings. And so think about this with me for a second. Childlike, there are some negative associations with childlike. And there are some positive associations associated with childlike, some implied meanings. If you say someone is childlike, in a negative way, you can mean they're emotionally immature. That's a negative connotation. Or if they're childlike, it can refer to they're a joyful, youthful a person. So do you see the associations that are implied in a word versus just their precise, literal meaning? Denotation, the literal connotation, more the implied associations that come with a term. All right, moving right along here. Meaning is context dependent. Context, context, context. We can never get away from it, can we? And so meaning is contextual. And so I want you to think about this. When you hear the word, oh my God, what does that mean? How do you interpret even the way I say it would affect how you interpret it. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. So lots of different ways, but when you see it on a page, how would you interpret, oh, my God? Well, if it's in the context of someone seeing a brand new car in the driveway and they said, oh, my God, that would be an expression of enthusiasm and joy. If you read it in the context of someone receiving bad news, the death of someone in the family, or a cancer diagnosis, and you hear someone say, oh my God, that is an expression of dismay and sadness. Or if you hear someone, if you read in the text that while they were praying, they said, oh my God, that would be a very different context, right? And so, oh my God, means nothing until it is placed in a sentence. 
until it has a context around it that helps you know exactly what the person is saying. So do you see the importance of context? Words only have meaning when they're placed in a context. So we always need to remember that meaning is based on context. So as we explore more about words, um, there is again an important hermeneutical term that you need to know. The study of meaning is called semantics. Semantics, so you could see that on a quiz. The study of the meaning of words is called semantics. And every word has a range of semantical meaning. There's a semantical range of meaning, which simply means when you look in your dictionary, you won't typically just see one definition. There are several different uses of a word, and so that's the range of meaning. That's the possibility of meanings. When you look at a Greek term, when you look at the term uh, pistis, when you look at the term grace, they, are, they have a range of meaning with the Greek words associated with them, and it's up to us to look at the range of meanings and how the term is used in a sentence and to determine what, were, what meaning is found in the text that you're looking at. So when you do word studies, I'll help you with this. We'll talk about it more in class. But this is what we're going to do is to try to find the precise meaning of a word in its particular context from the different range of meanings that are possible for it. All right. Now we're just going to kind of begin to run through some of the clues, some of the things you need to be looking for when you do your detailed analysis. So um, I warn you, this can feel a little bit overwhelming because there are so many different things to look for, but the more you do it, the more you'll see, the better you'll get at it. So here we go. It's important for you to look for the governing images or ruling metaphors. A governing image or ruling metaphor. I would suggest to you that body and bride are ruling metaphors and images in the book of Ephesians. And so, as we see here, we're going to look for similes, and a simile is a comparison using like or as. God is like a rock. Or we read in Isaiah 40, 31, that we will rise up with wings like an eagle. So that is a simile. Then there's metaphor, which is a comparison without using like or as, and that is God is a rock. He doesn't say God is like a rock, but that's what he's doing. He's using a metaphor. So as you look in your text, you need to dis decide, are there some metaphors that control the meaning of my passage? Is Paul building on some metaphors, some allusions to images that control the meaning of my text? Okay, that's important to look for that. All right. As we look at um, our word studies, as we do detailed analysis, there's some landmines. There are some bombs that you need to watch out for that, don't, that you don't end up making some critical mistakes. So here are some critical lexical line mine, landmines, some word study issues that can pop up. So the first one, again, you could probably see this on a quiz. It's called illegitimate totality transfer. And that just simply means you dump everything in the kitchen sink into a word. That means it's like a gumbo down in Louisiana. You just throw everything into the pot. That means you take every meaning found in the dictionary and dump it into the word. And so that is a, a major issue. It's illegitimate totality transfer. You need to be more precise than dumping all the meanings into a word. Which specific meaning? is Paul using when he uses the term in your passage. That's your job to determine that. The next fallacy is probably one of my greatest pet peeves. <laughs> it's called the etymological fallacy. And that's breaking words into their component parts to determine their meaning. You've probably all heard a preacher or pastor at some time or another use the word ecclesia. And then they'll say ek means out. And klesia means called, called ones. And so they'll take out and called, called ones and say, ecclesia means called out ones. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, that's really an etymological fallacy. That's not the way we determine the meaning of words by taking their component parts and putting them together. Do you see how silly this would be if we came up with the meaning of the word butterfly? 
by breaking up its component parts and trying to define what a butterfly is by saying, it's butter plus a fly. Just silly, right? Or if you take the word greenhouse, greenhouse. If we define greenhouse as it must be a house painted green as opposed to a warm place that we grow tender young plants. And so do you see the fallacy in that? Words are defined by their context and their use, not by breaking them into their component parts. Really an important uh, tool for you to use in understanding the lexical definition of a term. All right, moving right along here, there are some lexical tools that, you'll, that will be at your disposal as you do your detailed analysis, and these tools are extremely critical. They are helpful shortcuts. They will make your jobs easier as a detective that is following the clues to solve the mystery. Remember, that's what detailed analysis is. You've got to sort through the evidence in order to solve the mystery. You've got to take some, uh, make some critical decisions about what pieces of information really matter most. So a Strong's Concordance is a tool that every one of you should have. And so we'll look at this in class. There's some numbers in the back of the Strong's Concordance for Greek words, and you'll find the number of the term in your passage, and then you'll begin to look at the range of meaning, how that term is used, and look at it in some different contexts and settings. And so I'll show you how to use a Strong's Concordance. And then there's a Vines Expository Dictionary. Strong's and Vines are beginner-level lexical tools very beginner level lexical tools. And so that's where I suggest that you begin with the Strong's Concordance, looking up the words that are in your text, and then going to the back and finding out which Greek term is associated with that um, word in your text. And so that'll be a helpful tool. Then Vines is our Greek um, lexical dictionary, okay? Greek dictionary. That's what Vines does. And so it'll give you some range of meanings for the term that you're looking at. Now, these next couple of tools are more high level. They're like Vines on steroids. And so there's, there's a little skill set that you need to use these. But if you want to drill down more in depth on a term, you would go to the Gordon Conwell Seminary and you would go into the reference section and you would find Colin Brown's Dictionary of New Testament Theology. And it's going to be vines on steroids. It's going to give you the pre-Greek history of a word. It's going to give you all the different uses of your Greek term. It's going to find the passage that you have, and you'll see what they say about the term and where they think it fits in the range of meaning. And so it's a very helpful tool. It's a shortcut for you to find the meaning of a couple of terms in your uh, final analysis of your text. So Colin Brown, a great tool to use. And then Kittle is the granddaddy of dictionaries for Greek and Hebrew. And it's a German developed um, tool that is extremely complex and extremely in-depth. And so you may want to look at it just for your own um, growth and kind of checking out what the tool looks like a little bit, but I suggest Colin Brown instead of Kittle. And so here are some quick tools that'll help you with your detailed analysis. All right, we're moving along. And so we've looked at words, and so now we're going to talk about clauses and phrases and sentences and so how they work. And so when we look at how words are related to one another in a text, we look at, we call that syntax. The arrangement of words into phrases and phrases into sentences is called syntax. And so the relationship of words, the key word is relationships, is really, really important how the words in your text are positioned and how they relate to one another. So sentence structure is important, and we want to teach you uh, how to observe the sentence structure and some conclusions that you can draw from your sentence structure and syntax. So here's what you need to look for in your sentence. And this is the parts of speech that we talk about so much, you need to be able to identify the noun, the subject of a sentence. You need to look at verbs, which carry the action of a sentence, really important. You need to look at prepositions, in and by and for, and different prepositions that also are extremely important, that carry great theological significance. 
Then you need to look at adverbs, which are L-Y words that modify verbs, and then adjectives that describe and are associated with nouns, okay? You need to look at tense. Is it a present tense word? Is it a past tense word? Is it a future tense word? Paying attention to tenses really matters when you look at your text. Then we need to look at mood. This is something most of you are not really familiar with, but there's an indicative mood and an imperative mood. Indicative is simply looking for a statement of facts. That means the mood is indicative. And so primarily when you look at Ephesians 1 through 3, it's in the indicative mood. It's stating facts. Then when you get, if you have a passage from 4 to 6 in the book of Ephesians, you'll find lots of imperatives. The imperative mood, which is commands, telling you what you should be doing, the action that Paul is asking you to take up. So is it indicative, looking at facts, or is it an imperative, a command? So that's important for you to look at. And then when you look at clauses, the phrases and how they're joined together, there's coordinate clauses, something like and or but that's joining two independent clauses, or is it a subordinate clause? So that, giving purpose or for, giving reason, and it's subordinate to the main sentence. And so you'll need to familiarize yourself with subordinate versus coordinate clauses. Don't get overwhelmed. You'll get better at this. Most of you do this instinctively as you go along just by just your experience of reading and being good readers. And so meaning is dependent upon relationship. And so I want to give you kind of a checklist of some of the relationships that you'll see in phrases and sentences that are important. So as you look at words and phrases and their relationship to one another, you want to ask, is this showing chronology? Is there a chronological relationship? You'll want to ask, is this making some kind of logical um, connection, a logical saying, giving a reason for, drawing a conclusion from, okay? So that's a logical connection. And then there's a condition. Is the text saying if or since? That's a conditional relationship. If it gives you a reason, this would be a logical because or purpose, so that or for. Then there's result or consequence, therefore, or so that. Then there's means or instrumentality. That's what a little word like by or through gives means or instrumentality. And then there's a concession being made with the term although. So those are relational connection terms that are important for you to pay attention to and to notice the relationship of the syntax of the sentences in your particular passage. So there's um, direct relationships like we just looked at, and then there's more implied relationships. And so when Paul makes a statement like, Jesus is Lord, there's an implied meaning that goes along with that. While he doesn't say these words directly or overtly, what he is saying is an implied relationship that's something like this. Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. So it's not only what he says, but what he doesn't say. There's an implication of what he says, and so we need to look at implied relationships as well when we're doing detailed analysis of the text. What did he say? What did he not say? And what are the implications of what he says? So that's something that we're looking into. We have to mention these. It's not a great focus of what you're going to be doing. This is what we would call diachronic analysis. And remember, we're doing synchronic analysis. We take the text in its final form and say, this is what we believe to be the inspired, authoritative word of God. But we also have to acknowledge that a part of exegesis, those uh, commentaries that you read, are going to do some source criticism, some form criticism, some redaction criticism. And so sources are... Moses wasn't around when Genesis was written, was when Genesis occurred, and so he uses some sources to construct Genesis. And so he is a compiler. He compiles. He does some redaction. Moses takes these sources, and he arranges them, compiles them, and even redacts them. If you went to the Heiser seminars, 
You'll notice that Heiser says the creation story comes from or is similar to a Mesopotamian source where there are parallels between the biblical source and the ancient Near Eastern source. That's not a problem. The text is simply taking a source familiar in the culture, the same way we use a movie illustration or using a common literary uh, book or story in our culture and then inserting biblical meaning toward it. And so that's what source and form and redaction criticism are doing is looking at how the authors used other sources, trying to get at what the original words of Jesus were versus how the church reported the words of Jesus. And so that's a little bit, but I don't need to, we don't want to go down that rabbit trail. If you go to seminary, if you pursue further theological education, these are big deals. But for what we're doing in our assignments today, that's not really an important thing. All right, intertextuality is something that I'm focused a lot on in my doctoral work, and so I want to mention that as we read the text, there are echoes from the Old Testament that Paul is picking up on. So if you're reading and you go, wow, that sounds strangely familiar. That sounds like an allusion to an Old Testament story, or that has some familiarity to me. And so Paul is a Jewish Pharisee converted to Christianity, and he is interpreting this new thing called Christianity through the theological language and lens of his Judaism. And so that's important. There are echoes of the Old Testament that we find within the New Testament, and so it's important to pay attention to that. I know this is what you're really interested in, which is help me figure out how to write this detailed analysis. Okay, the detailed analysis is really the meat and potatoes. This is where you're going to use commentaries and you're going to study and you're going to have to come to some conclusions about what the text means, what the author intended for his original audience. You are going to investigate facts and come to conclusions in this detailed analysis. Paul is saying, this word means, I conclude that the argument is moving in this direction based on the logic and the connection of the word therefore or but. And so there are connections that are being made. There are connections being made in this text. And so um, that's what you're doing with detailed analysis. So the normal procedure is to work systematically by text segment. When you did your outline, hopefully you grouped verses together that you felt like were similar. And so you'll use a segment and then investigate those verses in that segment of your outline. So it isn't a bad idea to use your outline of your passage as the structure of your detailed analysis. Just follow your outline and then take the couple of verses and your outline statement and then begin to build the case by showing how the details contribute toward your understanding of those couple of sentences. So you see where that, how that works? You'll need to do two word studies in your final paper, which will be included in this section, but you'll not have to do that for this paper simply because we haven't met face-to-face -to, -face to do that together, and I'll give you the tools to do that more in our face-to-face -face discussion, but this will be a part of what you do when you do detailed analysis. You may go even more in-depth into a cultural background issue discussed in contextual analysis. So this is important. So if you saw a detail in your formal analysis or your contextual analysis that is important to your text, this is where you'll pick up and really drill down deep and go into more detail. This is the heart and soul of an exegetical paper. This is how you support your conclusions. This is how you build your case. This is where you deliver the goods right here. So this is really important. This is the facts. This is how, if you were debating it, you would go back and say, pay attention to this. And because this is here, it means this. And because the logic of the passage and the context means this. So these are the ways that we support our understanding of what a text is saying and not saying. So there it is. There are some hints on how you would go about constructing your rough draft of your detailed analysis. So does this picture look how you're feeling right now? Are you a little bit overwhelmed? So if you're feeling overwhelmed, 
I just want you to know that you're going to get better at this, and practice makes perfect, and the more you look, the more you see. And so I need you to relax, so you'll, you'll get better at this. I'm going to give you feedback on this. We're going to practice this together, and then you'll have the ultimate practice of constructing your final exegetical paper, given the feedback that I give and the tools that you learn to, to use in the class. So that's how we're going to do detailed analysis, all right? So I need you to stand up real quick and take a stretch break. Because the mind cannot absorb what the buns cannot endure, okay? Or you can only take so much of me until you need to take a little break. So take a deep breath. All right. Now we're going to catch up on a little Scott McKnight and your blue parakeet reading because it's extremely important how he's showing how hermeneutics comes to bear on important issues and particularly the role of women. So that's what we're going to look at now just for a couple of minutes. There's our pretty blue parakeet and we're going to be examining chapter 14 and hopefully you've read chapters 12 and 13, which trace the role of women in ministry in the Old and New Testaments. So it's important to follow those clues, to check out the hermeneutical arc of the passage. And so this is very, very important. So here we go. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15. And so remember our different ways of approaching the text. Some people say we retrieve all. We go back and retrieve all. And some people say we go back and we retrieve some, which I think is much more accurate, or we use, we read with tradition or through tradition or we challenge tradition. So when you read this, I need you to make a check mark by the parts of this that you think are cultural that apply that don't apply today and the things that do apply today. So here's where, here we go. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, when Timothy says males should pray with their hands lifted up. Is that something that Paul is commanding us to do? Does it apply today? If you say yes, check it. Say, yeah, that's something that we need to do. It's not something that was way back then. We're going to retrieve it and bring that into our world today. Males should pray without anger or disputing. Is that for today? Or that was then, this is now. Women should dress modestly. What do you think, ladies? So should women dress modestly? Is that something that was just an issue back then? Or is Paul addressing it for today? Women should not have elaborate hairstyles or wear gold or pearls or expensive clothing. Ladies, you don't re want to retrieve that part, do you? That would mess with you. No more going to expensive hair appointments and buying jewelry and all of this kind of stuff because Paul is telling you there's no need for that. Are you going to retrieve that and bring that forward or are you going to leave that back there? Women should have good deeds. Is that for today or still back then? Women should be silent and quiet. Okay, learn your place. So as that's, we conveniently want, don't want to retrieve that one, do we? That was then, this is now. So what do you think? Most of the guys are too afraid to answer because they don't want to incur your wrath in class, okay? So women should be silent and be quiet. Is that something that applies today? Women should not teach or have authority over men. This is really the main crux of the issue, isn't it? So on this list, are there some that you said, no, that doesn't apply anymore? And some that you said, yeah, that applies and some you kind of said, I'm really not sure. Well, this is the issue. This is the issue on, on this passage is used by so many to limit the role of women, and we need to understand it and investigate it and understand, more importantly, the methodology that we use. So when someone wants to limit the role of women, you need to take them through this exercise and say, oh, you didn't retrieve that and move that forward? Why not? Why not? If you're going to retrieve it, you got to have a reason for why you retrieve some parts and don't retrieve others. So this is an important issue that we're going to investigate. Genesis 3.16 is perhaps the turning point. 
I would say our understanding of male-female relationships is rooted in Genesis 1, 26 through 28, when we have the creation in its perfection. But we see in Genesis 3, 16, that something happens. It's typically called in theological circles the fall of humanity. And we read in Genesis 3, and so this is a key interpretive decision that we make around the role of women. To the woman, he said, this is a curse on the woman, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. I always say, if men had babies, every family would only have one. Okay, we're wimps. So the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet, your desire will be for your husband. You'll desire relationship, intimacy, connection. And then the last phrase is really important. And he will rule over you. So if this is a prescription, some say this is the natural order of how God intended the male-female relationship to work. The man rules and the woman submits. Or is this more of a prediction of the curse and what happened with the curse and something that God never intended and is only in effect because of the curse? So this is an important exegetical decision. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we begin to watch this hermeneutical arc from the Old Testament in the relationship of males and females in ministry. And then we come to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and this is one of those massive shifts. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So the question is, what's the new that's come? And has the new that's come impacted the roles of men and women in ministry and in relationships? So this is important for us to take a closer look at. Acts 2, 16 through 18 is the day that the music of the fall died and the new music of the new creation in Christ began to play. This is Pentecost. This is when the Spirit falls. This is when the new covenant is becoming ratified in the people of God because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And so Pentecost, we read, but this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Something's coming true from Joel chapter 2. And it shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. He's saying that's what's happening here at Pentecost. The spirit's being poured out. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. That's no small statement there because from the Old Testament, we would see a patriarchal society that women would be viewed as less than. To say that the Spirit is poured out on sons and daughters is important, that they'll prophesy, both male and female will prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men like me will even have dreams. Okay? Even on my bond slaves, this is one of those unfortunate translations, even on slaves, even on those who are viewed as possessions and property, those that are viewed as less than human, both male and female slaves, the Spirit of God is coming upon them. Can you see the shift in the hermeneutical arc going this way, shifting the way males and females and all humanity relates to one another? This is really important here, really amazing shifting passage. Mm -hmm. And he says, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So I would argue a P, a Philippian, or Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 18 is one of the most important passages that shows the new creation ethic and new creation dynamics and what is being redeemed from the fall of Genesis 3, 16. We see that here in Acts chapter 2, verses 16 through 18. So Scott McKnight in his book makes a very wise statement where he says, to build our view of women on 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 16, and 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35, is like building a theology of marriage on the divorce passages. 
we need to start with the bigger picture of the Old Testament and the New Testament. That was chapters 12 and 13. And now we need to address these problematic passages. But we have to set them in the broader context of the box top of God's Word. And so what we know from Paul is this. Paul elevated women. Paul is the one who wrote in Galatians 3.28, There's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Jew nor Gentile. We're all one in Christ. That's the same guy in 1 Corinthians 11 who talks about women prophesying. And we know from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that prophecy is one of the highest spiritual gifts that anyone can have. If we're ranking them in order, the prophetic is extremely high in the ordering of spiritual gifts. So women prophesied, according to Paul. If you check out Romans chapter 16, you will find that Phoebe is a house pastor. Phoebe is an important role player in the kingdom of God that Paul elevates. Junia is called an apostle. Priscilla is a major player. Priscilla and her husband Aquila, but Priscilla leads the way in um, in Paul's world. And so Paul is someone who redeems women, who works side by side with women, who calls them apostles and deacons and elevates their leadership capacity. So we need to ask the question, what in the world is Paul doing in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 through 35? This is the silencing of women in church. So I'll give you my thoughts. There are many different ways to interpret this. But check this out. The women are to keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but are to subject themselves just as the law also says. It's an important statement. Just as the law also says. If they desire to learn anything, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. One of the more popular explanations of this passage is that married women and men were having conversations in church disrupting the church service. So men would have sat on one side, women on another. And so when the uh, teacher was teaching, a woman would say, hey, honey, what is he talking about? I don't understand. And the husband, here's what he's talking about while the communicator is communicating. It was disruptive to the house church, to the contextual setting. And so that's what some say is going on here. I don't think that's what's going on here. So what I think is going on here is that the 1 Corinthians chapter 7 through 1 Corinthians chapter 16 is actually Paul's Q&A with the Corinthians. If you want to go back and check, you'll see 1 Corinthians 7, 1 talks about you have written. So the Corinthians wrote a letter where they asked Paul questions. And then Paul, in this section from chapter 7 to chapter 16, is responding to the questions of their previous letter. Now, what's so misleading is the fact that in the Greek, we don't have quotation marks, and so it's hard to know, is it Paul saying this or the Corinthians saying this? And so I would make the argument that 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 35 are not the words of the Apostle Paul. This is the Corinthian statement. This is what Corinthians are saying about women. This is how Corinthians are limiting the role of women. This is patriarchalism that's being used here. And one of the biggest clues that I use to make this argument is this. Just as the law also says, there is no scholar has been able to find where the law says that women are not permitted to speak. There's no place in the law where this is addressed. So it's significant to kind of give us a clue. This is out of character for what Paul would have done in the rest of his letters, the way he esteems and values and talks about the new creation redemptive ethic of women, and then all of a sudden to say, be silent, be quiet. He's elevated them to apostle position. He's elevated them to deacon position. They're pastoring churches. They're teaching people, Priscilla and Aquila. It would be out of character for him to limit them in some way. So that's my view of 1 Corinthians 14. Now the most important passage of all, the one that anyone who believes in hierarchicalism, believes that women shouldn't teach, shouldn't be in leadership positions, women should be subordinate, women should not, uh, their role is primarily or exclusively in the home. This is where they go. 
They go to Ephesians chapter, I mean, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 through 15. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. So if you take this passage literally or overly literally or interpret it to mean that women should not lead, then you need to be consistent. They shouldn't lead in youth ministries. They shouldn't lead in, in singles ministries. There is no context that is ever appropriate for a woman to teach a man or to lead a man. Not in the choir, on the worship team, never. So if you take it that way, then I want to challenge you to be consistent with what you think it means. goes on, and the average church, about 60, 70, maybe even 80% of the work of a church is done by women. Women lead and do a heck of a lot of teaching in small groups and all sorts of different contexts. So he goes on and says, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. And check out this word, for. That little preposition for gives the reason. It's an explanatory gar. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. Is this a cultural argument or a creational argument? It's quite obvious, isn't it? It's a creational argument. But what in the world is Paul doing? He's saying a woman shouldn't teach or lead, and then he goes back to creation and explains why. For Adam was created first and then Eve. What is the significance of Adam being created first and then Eve? How would that bear on whether a woman should be able to teach or lead men? He goes on. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. That's where we want to stop and look at that because here's what I think happened. Adam, Paul brings this up because Adam was created first. Where was Eve when God gave Adam the prohibition not to eat of the tree? Are you thinking? Where was Eve? Was she around? And the answer is, she was just a twinkle in Adam's eye. She was still in his rib. She didn't hear God say, of this tree you shall not eat. She did not receive direct revelation from God about the prohibition. Adam was the receiver of the revelation. The woman was not educated about this. We know this from the fact that when the evil one tempts Eve and said, did, did, did God say that you really can't eat? And she said, yeah, God said that we can't eat nor touch. But we know when we look at the prohibition that God never said you can't touch it. Eve obviously misunderstood. There was a breakdown in her receiving of revelation. And so what's going on here is Adam is the one held responsible for the revelation he didn't do a very good job of getting the revelation to Eve. And so the only reason why a woman should be limited in leading or exercising authority is because they haven't received the same level of revelation or education that a man has received. I'm teaching this in an SCU class where there are very gifted and talented and smart women who know every bit as much as the men that they study side by side by. So as women are educated, so they are free to lead and to teach. Paul is simply saying that if you don't have revelation, if you don't have education, then you shouldn't be teaching or leading in the church. So here's the bottom line. There's silence only for women who've not been taught. That's Paul's point. Silence for women who've not been taught. Women who've not been taught shouldn't exercise leadership. There's a certain level of Christian maturity that's required of someone to lead and to exercise authority in the kingdom of God and in the body of Christ. So I hope that's helped you to kind of take those two scary passages and make sure we don't use the prohibitions on divorce to define marriage and we shouldn't use these 
too difficult passages to define what the scriptures and the hermeneutical arc of the scriptures clearly shows is a path and a pattern toward redeeming women to their creational status as co-image bearers of God, both called to reign and rule and have dominion on this earth. So that's where we conclude for the role of women out of Blue Parakeet chapter 14. And I can't wait to touch base with you next week face to face and to hear your thoughts on this as well as how your detailed analysis goes. Remember, the devil's in the details as you observe your text and dig for the gold. Remember contextually, who says so? As you make arguments from contextual, historical situations, social, political, contextual situations, make sure that that is an argument that has substance. And then as we go to formal analysis, as you look at the literary devices in your text, you need to ask the question, how do it do what it do? How do it do it? So your literature has a how to it. And so it's important to pay attention to that. And when we do detailed analysis, the bottom line is you're the detective following the clues to solve the mystery of the meaning of the text. Can't wait to see you on Monday. God bless.